Namaste, and welcome to our continuing series on the Essays on the Gita with our beloved Ranga. We are on, I have page 42, beginning with the sentence, Moreover, every time we use soul force. So, he is discussing the principle of ahimsa. There are three chapters on this. Violence and destruction and ahimsa. There is usually a, an idea in the normal human being that destruction is bad. It is something negative. Okay, so Srimba is trying to explain to us very clearly that creation and destruction always go together. They are part of the dualities in the physical world. So to insist on only one side is not a proper integral way of looking at things. That's what, the three chapters on it. Okay, so, and destruction is as much a reality as war. Okay, now, war can be unjustified, but it can also be justified. Destruction also in the same way, violence and destruction can be unjustified, but it can also be justified. So, we shouldn't jump to conclusions and take one-sided decisions. That's basically the idea. <laughs> and um, ahimsa, non-violence is praised very much by everybody. Yes, non-violent. In fact, several, you know, all over the world, Martin Luther in America tried the technique. Then our, uh, in South Africa, uh, Mandela also tried the technique. They succeeded to a certain extent because the opposition was not the Japanese or the Germans. <laughs> if they had to face them, what would have happened? They would have simply knocked you off. <laughs> this gentleman who was very close to Mandela came to the Matramandya the other day and spoke with me for some time. We went up to the chamber also. What was his name? I don't remember <laughs> that, he, that he even told me his name, but so, to, ahimsa is good at a certain level. Nobody is mm. saying it's bad. Yes, yes. But at, it's not universally applicable in all circumstances. That's the whole point. So, <laughs> that's what he has said. And then, normally we think of ahimsa at the physical level. Normally, when you say ahimsa, don't... Uh, at the physical level, it's really bad. That's what the general idea. Now, Sri is discussing there and he's saying, what about violence at the vital level? What about violence at the mental level? Are those allowed? That's what I, What about soul force? He is discussing that. And the other day we had a discussion on soul force. And I gave you two, three examples of soul force. Huh? Mother used soul force. Sri is using soul force for determining events in the world. Okay? That is soul force. So, is that okay? So then... Will that mitigate the harm done by violence used in the wrong just in the wrong way? That's the discussion he has. And then he says it's not like that at all. The violence in the physical world and violence in the vital world and violence in the in the soul force also it has the same effect. The same effect it destroys. Mm. So soul force doesn't mean that there's no destruction. So that's what we will discuss today. I'll only read the little bit of that soul force towards the end of the, the previous chapter. So I'll read from... Yeah, uh, quite high up actually. We will use only soul force and never destroy by war. Okay, you got it? Yeah. Got it. Ah. So, we will use only soul force and never destroy by war or any even defensive employment of physical violence. Shremdi is asking a question. Is that okay? Soul force is alright. It will not create any destruction. That's okay. So Shremdi says, good. Though until soul force is effective, the asuric force in men and nations tramples down, breaks, slaughters, burns, pollutes, as we see it doing today, but then at its ease and unhindered. Okay. And you have perhaps caused as much destruction of, of life by your abstinence as others by resort to violence. So if you say, I am not going to employ 
violence you want to employ you can you like gandhi used to say you can kill my body but are you going to kill my soul it doesn't matter to me by abstinence you are doing more harm same this thing because the opponent will have an easy access to finish you off they are not resisting so it can be worse that's what he's saying eh? we will use only soul force and never destroy by war or any even defensive employment of physical violence good though until soul force is effective the asuric force in men and nations tramples down breaks slaughters burns pollutes as we see it doing today but then at its ease and unhindered and you have perhaps caused as much destruction of life by your abstinence as others by resort to violence the effect is the same whether you in other words you cannot eliminate destruction in the world whatever you do individually uh, Still, i have i have a question yeah until soul force is effective yes that means to say you don't have soul force you don't resist by me- other means you can defend yourself with arms you can defend yourself by a a moral uh, stature you can also defend yourself by soul force but until you don't have that even the opponent will have a walk over <laughs> he'll just finish you off that's what he say then he is saying something more interesting he is saying you have set up an ideal which may some day and at any rate ought to lead to better things yes ahimsa is okay it's a ideal which if it is realized one day it will be very good but can it be realized that's what he is discussing in the three chapters it cannot be realized unless until your ignorance is gone so if your ignorance ego attachment and desires don't go destruction is going to remain always there that's the point but in this supermental race where or in a spiritual race where there is no ignorance some amount of non violence will be possible but at the supermental level it can be eliminated altogether but not before that that's what he's saying but even soul force when it is effective destroys so this is what we have to see what he is saying okay because this is that's why i stopped the other day from saying you have to look into it and think about it okay let's see what sir noy is saying okay he is saying even if you use soul force it destroys what are you destroying you are destroying your enemy but that's destruction whether the destruction is good or bad is not the question you are destroying <laughs> now take the second world war okay Shemda was opposing it with soul force, right? Very strongly. Very strongly, he was defending. He was opposing the soul force. Why? Because Hitler was a not only Hitler but the Japanese also. They were wrong, hostile powers. They were anti-divine forces. The Axis powers, including Italy, a little bit. Italy also was an Axis power. Mussolini. The Axis power. Mussolini. Uh, Mussolini Yes he was he was Yeah Of course he was conquered very easily but right. Germany and uh, Japan lasted a long time So <clears throat> now he's saying only but even soul force when it is effective destroys only those who have used it with eyes open know how much more terrible and destructive it is than the sword and the cannon Whoa. Okay So it is can be much more it can destroy Then <laughs> so if remdo is countering hitler is not going to fall into peace there will be no peace there will be even more intense war that's what he's saying that soul force also is not going to give you ahimsa it is going to give you destruction i have heard only heard and i have read i have read that sri arbindo used churchill as an instrument Of course but I, but I don't know if he actually put the words into Churchill. Um he is giving the essence and therefore his speeches were so fantastic. They were. They absolutely and Churchill as a normal human man was a despicable man. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Everybody knows that. Yeah. But he used him to use him as a an instrument. And Churchill knew this. 
Churchill didn't know that Sremdo is guiding him, but he knew, I know that there is a force guiding me. And that's why he was so sure of victory. Uh. In 1942, uh, I think it was in the dunk of time, when all the British generals, they came to Churchill and said, start negotiating for peace. Right. He refused. Mm -hmm. Because 300,000 uh, soldiers, the Allied soldiers were on the um, Normandy coast. And there was no chance Germany could have just bombarded them and finished 300,000 at one stroke. But they didn't. From those guidance, okay. A, a, a fog came, which was untimely. Fogs don't come at that time. And they all crossed over in, in big boats, small boats, rowing boats, sailboats. It was an unbelievable phenomenon in the Second World War. Dunkirk. There's even uh, several movies are there on it. Very interesting. So, then what happened? Once that was done, Germany was laid waste. Destruction. In Japan, it was even worse. Yeah. They were knocked out two cities in three hours, completely destroyed. Soul force, destruction. It's very clear. Then there's another interesting destruction also that happened. As soon as India became free, Okay, Sremda was putting all his force for the India's independence. He says very clearly, I am not fighting now at a physical or political level, but I am fighting with my own way through my spiritual power, he says. Soul force and spiritual power, same. Then what happened? When India became free, was it only India becoming free? No. The entire colonial system all over the world, in two, three years it collapsed. This is something that is not very well known. Okay? But all the nations which were there under colonialists, because Brit India was a crown in the British Empire. And when that was disappeared, everybody started becoming nervous. The colonial powers. Oh, we are still going to be called colonial powers and we'll be looked down upon. They rushed to free the, all the countries. 90% of all countries attained independence after India's freedom. So, the colonial system, in fact, it is such an important phenomena that they divide history, post-colonialism and pre-colonialism. They speak of post-colonialism. What happened after that and what happened before? The two things are totally different. In literature, they speak of post-colonialism. <laughs> hmm. So, destruction. So, this is what Sremdo is saying. Of course, mother also telling Hitler to invade Russia. Yes. A lot of destruction. That, Millions right. were killed. That's right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, to jump to conclusions and think that Ahimsa is an absolute value is not true. That's what is basic contention. Okay, so now... Only those who have used it with eyes open know how much more terrible and destructive it is than the sword and the cannon. And only those who do not limit their view to the act and its immediate results can see how tremendous are its after effects, how much is eventually destroyed and with that much all the life that depended on it and fed upon it. Evil cannot perish without the destruction of much that lives by evil. And it is no less destruction, even if we personally are saved and pain of a sensational act of violence. Even if you resist, maybe individually you have benefited. But are you establishing peace and um, uh, abolishing violence and war in the world? No, it will continue. So that's what he's saying. <laughs> now we read the next para. Moreover, every time we use soul force, we raise a great force of karma against our adversary, the after movements of which we have no power to control. Now that's interesting. You are opposing your adversary with soul power, not with physical power. But you are ensuring the destruction of the adversary and then you have no more control over it. Now I know what he's speaking about. Suddenly the idea has come. He is fighting the British okay, with soul force. 
right before the world war when the world war started he realized that he has no control over the forces that he has put forward for the destruction of britain now he has to support britain and he has no control over what he has done that's what he is speaking about it is just struck me in fact everybody in the ashram got annoyed why are you supporting the british we have been fighting them so he says that you don't have control over what you have initiated <laughs> okay so moreover every time we use our force we raise a great force of karma against our adversary now replace adversary by britain britain as a colonial power in india okay he is using his force to destroy the after movements of which we have no power to control <laughs> Interesting. Vasi. Now he has given another example. Vasishta uses soul force against the military violence of Vishwamitra, and the armies of Huns and Shakas and Pallavis hurl themselves on the aggressor. And uh, this uh, story about Vasishta and uh, Vishwamitra, I am just telling you briefly what it is. Uh, since he has mentioned, we might as well know it. Vishwamitra was a king, not the sage. Maybe that afterward, but this, he was a king, and. Vasishta was a sage, and he had what is called the Kama Dhenu. The Kama Dhenu is a cow that yields all your wishes. Okay, this is a spiritual power that happens. The Sri Aurobindo says in the synthesis that consciousness and concentration have three powers. Okay, you can know whatever you want if you have concentration and consciousness. you can know whatever you want you can acquire whatever you want and you can become whatever you want these are the three powers of consciousness so acquire everything you want so that's what happens when you go to a certain level of consciousness whatever you want it is uh, the one of the eight ashta siddhis one of the eight powers that yogis have to acquire anything that they want okay so whatever you want comes to you you must be very careful as to how you have to interpret this because does it mean to say that i can get anything i want ice cream and wealth and good uh, house and a car no because at that time you don't have any desire <laughs> so when you have got rid of your desire then this this can work <laughs> it's interesting so that's what the students ask me oh it's like that now kama dhenu is one way of putting it kama dhenu means the cow which yields all your wishes wish yielding cow but there is also it puts in another way they call it a kalpataru kalpataru is a wish fulfilling tree okay but it's only a way of saying it's a power that you acquire when you go to the spiritual planes of consciousness okay so vasishtha was a spiritual he was a sage and he had the kama dhenu okay now it becomes a physical kama dhenu and vishwamitra wanted that and he comes and asks him please give me your that cow i want it and vashishtha says no i'm sorry i can't give it to you then he goes to war against vashishtha okay but vashishtha uses soul power he doesn't resist him physically he uses soul power so that's why he is referring to this that's the story the very quiescence and passivity of the spiritual man under violence and aggression awakens the tremendous forces of the world to a retributive action and it may even be more merciful to stay in their path though by force those who represent evil than to allow them to trample on until they call down on themselves a worse destruction than we would ever think of inflicting he said it is better to oppose the adversary if necessary by force but don't be i am a peaceful man i will apply ahimsa i will not do anything it is not enough that our own hands should remain clean and our souls unstained for the law of strife and destruction to die out of the world however perfect and harmless you are you are not going to eliminate the violence and destruction in the world for that to happen there has to be do totally different conditions an entire race must come up which is free of desire attachment ego and they are at a spiritual level then automatically 
peace and non-violence will reign. But not before that. <laughs> Would this in any way be about the sun-eyed children who descend? Uh, the sun-eyed children are the, the supermental race. Yeah, yeah. They are the supermental race. Yes. They are, you remember the passage, they are the architects of the future, they are yes. the builders of new things. Yes. They'll come with all these powers. It's a fantastic description, that whole passage. <laughs> so yes, they are the superman. And in that, in that race, there will be no violence. But that doesn't mean to say that violence will disappear from the earth. Mm. The animals will continue to eat each other. The lion will continue to jump on the deer and eat him up. Man also, there will be war, but no war and no destruction in the supramental race. That's the thing. And uh, there is a very interesting uh, uh, poem by uh, William Blake also on this. Tiger, tiger burning bright in the forests of the night. <laughs> okay. So, he, it's a problem of evil and violence. Did he who make the lamb make thee? He's asking the tiger. Yes. God has created here destruction and creation, yeah. sweetness and gentleness and cruelty. Is he the same who has done this? <laughs> That's the problem he's dealing with. Okay. It's a very interesting poem. Very much. So, so, it is not enough that our own hands should remain clean and our souls unstained for the law of strife and destruction to die out of the world. That which is its root must first disappear out of humanity. And what is that which is the root? Attachment, ignorance, ego, desire. These are the things that have to be rooted out. If that is not rooted out, violence and destruction will always be there. <laughs> Much less will mere immobility and inertia, unwilling to use or incapable of using any kind of resistance to evil, abrogate the law. And what is that law? Inertia tamas. Indeed, injures much more than can the Rajasic principle of strife, which at least creates more than it destroys. So tamas is status quo. Peace, but it's a negative peace. It's not a positive peace. So, and uh, the uh, all the violence and the destruction starts at the vital level. But the vital level also is creating. <laughs> new life is being born and new. So this is, as soon as it comes, it is doing both. So they are allied. The duality is in the physical world. Okay. So, of strife at least creates more than it destroys. Therefore, so far as the problem of the individual's action goes, his abstention from strife and its inevitable concomitant destruction in their more gross and physical form may help his own moral being, but it leaves the slayer of creatures unabolished. The slayer of creatures is an S cap. Okay? It reminds you again of the 11th chapter in the Gita. Time the destroyer. He is destroying. He is telling Arjuna that I have already finished all these people. You are only the instrument in the physical world. Do that. And then he has a vision that there is destruction, constant destruction going on. All the Kauravas are running into his mouth and getting stuck in his teeth. <laughs> it's a terrific description. <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> that's what he's saying. Now, we can go to the next one. <clears throat> For the rest, the whole of human history bears witness to the inexorable vitality and persistent prevalence of this principle in the world. It is natural that we should attempt to palliate, to lay stress on other aspects. Strife and destruction are not all. There is a saving principle of association and mutual help as well as the force of dissociation and mutual strife. A power of love no less than a power of egoistic self-assertion. An impulse to sacrifice ourselves for others as well as the impulse to sacrifice others 
to ourselves. We'll go through it after we read the whole para. But when we see how these have actually worked, we shall not be tempted to gloss over or ignore the power of their opposites. Association has been worked not only for mutual help, but for the sa- at the same time for defense and aggression to strengthen us against all that attacks or resists in the struggle for life. Association itself has been a servant of war, egoism and self-assertion of life against life. Love itself has been constantly power of death. Especially the love of good and the love of God is embraced by the as embraced by the human ego have been responsible for much strife, slaughter, destruction. Self-sacrifice is great and noble, but at its highest, it is an acknowledgement of the law of life by death and becomes an offering on the altar of some power that demands a victim in order that the work desired may be done. The mother bird facing the animal of prey in defense of its young, the patriot dying for his country's freedom, the religious martyr or the martyr of an idea. These in the lower and superior scale of animal life are highest examples of self-sacrifice and it is evident to what they bear witness. It's a very interesting uh, discussion and we have to see what is meaning. They are interlinked very much. Okay, Good can be used for wrong purposes. Even the peace can be used for wrong purposes and violence can be used for good purposes. That also is possible. So they are interlinked very strongly. Absolutely, they go together. That's what he's giving examples now. We'll have a look at that. For the rest, the whole of human history bears witness to the inexorable vitality and persistent prevalence of this principle in the world. Which principle? That violence and destruction are always there. You can't avoid that. Okay, It is there. History is showing you that. Okay, We'll see examples. It is natural that we should attempt to palliate. To palliate? To try to cure it temporarily. A palliative is that which relieves your pain temporarily. So, not permanently. So, any attempt at ahimsa is only a palliative. It doesn't last. That's what he's saying. Okay? But it's natural. Because human beings are automatically rejected and disgusted with violence. They don't like. And that's because of weakness in the vital, not strength. Weakness in the vital. Very clearly in the Gita, Arjuna's saying, I will not fight, is his vital weakness. He is not able to bear the slaughter. There are people who faint even when they see blood. <laughs> there, it's a very interesting thing. This is vital weakness. You should have the capacity to, or if there is an accident in the road suddenly, okay, and there's, there are some people who will withdraw themselves. They will not go and try to help. <laughs> so it's a vital weakness. So there is a difference between pity and compassion. Pity is vital weakness, but compassion is strength. <laughs> you know what to do to cure the situation. So, to palliate, to lay stress on other aspects. When you see violence, you want to palliate and get rid of the violence and you want to bring back peace. But it's only a palliative. To lay stress on other aspects, the ahimsa. Violence is you find it very disgusting and you want to bring in ahimsa. You want to bring in (coughs) non-violence. He's saying it's natural for man to do that. Strife and destruction are not all. Now that's interesting. He's saying strife and destruction are not all. There is a saving principle of association and mutual help. So in the physical world, cruelty is not the only thing. There is also kindness and wanting to help. That also is there. That's the opposite. Isn't it? So 
strife and destruction are not all there is a saving principle of association and mutual help but does association and mutual help always pro- produce ahimsa or will it produce himsa that's what is going to discuss even love normally should give you peace and harmony and quietness will it that's what he is discussing okay it's very interesting discussion <laughs> so <clears throat> strife and strife association and mutual help as well as the force of dissociation and mutual strife okay this is what happens a power of love no less than a power of egoistic self assertion okay all these are the opposites the dualities okay. an impulse to sacrifice ourselves for others as well as the impulse to sacrifice others for ourselves both exist the patriot is willing to sacrifice himself for others but if selfishness is there you are quite willing to sacrifice others for yourself this is what's happening in business all the time you want to kill the competitor <laughs> Isn't it? That's what Swami is saying. Okay, so why only in business? Everywhere, okay. Even in a company where there is you, there is one post and there are three, four candidates. You want yourself and you want to spread lies against the other one. It's happening all the time. So this, he's saying that's happening all the time. You want to help others and you can sacrifice yourself, but you also want to sacrifice others for yourself if you are selfish. Both the things are there in the world <laughs> it's not that only this is there then an impulse to sacrifice ourselves for others as well as the impulse to sacrifice others to ourselves but when we see how these have actually worked we shall not be tempted to gloss over or ignore the power of their opposites so <laughs> to say that we want peace we want harmony we want quiet we want only gentleness you are not being realistic that's what i'm really saying you have to look at both sides and understand the nature of reality which is full of opposites you will never be able to conquer an enemy only with kindness you must know his weakness also attack him that's what he's pointing out okay so <clears throat> we will not gloss over very uh, with a happy uh, and uh, uh, very easy optimism we'll see only beauty in the world no there is a lot of ugliness also in the world that's what he's saying you have to be very very objective <laughs> we shall not be tempted to gloss over or ignore the power of their opposites association has been worked not only for mutual help but at the same time for defense and aggression that's what happened with uh, india we had a pact with russia before we started the uh, war in bangladesh association okay nato cato these are all pacts for they are associations they are treaties they are compacts why against the enemy <laughs> that's what sir is pointing out association is not always something for only for peace it is also for war <laughs> okay so <clears throat> then uh, association has been worked out for mutual help but at the same time for defense and aggression to strengthen us against all that attacks or resists in the struggle for life association itself has been a servant of war very obvious or nato okay it's a servant of war egoism and the self assertion of life against life okay love itself has been constantly the power of death the best example romeo juliet <laughs> love leading to death <laughs> okay and this theme is so interesting all over the world there are stories which parallel romeo and juliet in india we have also rastam and ah uh, laila majnu okay so everywhere these stories are there in all cultures I recognize that these things are always that they are the opposites <laughs> so love has itself been constantly the power of death especially the love of good and the love of god best example the islamic terror they are killing for love of god <laughs> all the crusades also 
crusades. Exactly. So, we want, we are fighting for God. <laughs> okay. So, has been responsible for much strife, slaughter, destruction. Self-sacrifice is great and noble. Now, he is discussing the self-sacrifice. Sacrificing others, he has already dealt with. Okay. So, now self-sacrifice is great and noble. But at its highest, it's an acknowledgement of the law of life by death and becomes an offering on the altar of some power that demands a victim in order that the work desired may be done. Yes. Very interesting. Even human sacrifice yes. has been a all over the world. It's not only in one culture. Everywhere the human sacrifice concept is there. Percy is the deliverer. Best example. <laughs> so, this is love, okay? And self-sacrifice. Then he's giving a very interesting... So, self years you are destroying yourself for good. So, in other words, for good, destruction also is used. So, you see the intricacy. <laughs> destruction is not always bad. Destruction can also cause good <laughs> and love. Mm -hmm. So, all this we have to see and then decide whether ahimsa is a absolute, it has absolute validity or not. That's what Srimad is pointing out. Okay, so <clears throat> self-sacrifice is no great and noble, but at its highest, it's an acknowledgement of the law of life by death and becomes an offering on the altar of some power that demands a victim in order that the work desired may be done. Then he's giving beautiful examples. The mother bird facing the animal of prey in defense of its young. It is willing to sacrifice itself. Destruction for love of the young. The patriot dying for his country's freedom. Same. The religious martyr or the martyr of an idea. Joan of Arc. Then Socrates. He had the idea that you trying to reform society. He was poisoned to death. <laughs> okay. Even our in our story also in Mira, okay, Mira. She was given poison. She didn't die because of her reliance on Krishna. <laughs> so this is what he's saying that always the martyr of the idea. Um, in Europe, any martyr of an idea? Martyr, I can't remember. But uh, in the French Revolution, uh, many of these people who fought for the change, Egalité, Fraternité, Danton, Robespierre, all of them were guillotined. <laughs> so that's a martyr of an idea. Even for an idea, you are willing to kill. <laughs> okay? So, the, these in the lower and superior scale of animal life are the highest examples of self-sacrifice. And it is evident to what they bear witness. In other words, even for good, destruction is sometimes necessary. <laughs> that's what he's pointing out. And this is something that's happening all the time. In any city, old buildings are being destroyed so that the new can come up. In yoga also, you are destroying your old nature in order to bring in the new nature. Destruction and construction. Creation and destruction always go together. But if we look at after results, an easy optimism becomes even less possible. Okay? See the patriot dying in order that his country may be free and mark that country a few decades after the lord of karma has paid the price of the blood and the suffering that was given. You shall see it in its turn in a, sorry, you shall see it in its turn an opposite oppressor an exploiter and conqueror of colonies and dependencies, devouring others, that it may live and succeed aggressively in life. I'll finish the para and then we'll come back to it. The Christian martyrs perish in their thousands, setting soul force against empire force that Christ may conquer. Christianity prevail. Soul force does triumph. Christianity does prevail but not Christ. The victorious religion becomes a militant and dominant church and a more fanatically persecuting power 
then the creed and the empire which it replaced the very religions organized themselves into powers of mutual strife and battle together fiercely to live to grow to possess the world okay now the exploited the victim is becoming the aggressor the best example in the world israel israel was suffered a lot she never always put down everywhere but when they had a territory of their own they have become the aggressor <laughs> i'm not making any judgment okay neither good nor bad because this is the world all judgments are of no use because both the things are there so someone who has suffered a lot okay when he gets a chance he becomes the oppressor the oppressed becomes the oppressor that's what i'm just pointing out <laughs> so quickly we'll go through but if we look at the after results an easy optimism becomes even less possible the easy optimism look only on the sweet mellifluousness of life and don't see the ugliness that is not something that is um that's not the right way of looking at things okay you have to see both judge both there is this and that then only you will come to have true knowledge otherwise it will be defective <laughs> we come back to that famous uh, robert browning's poem pippa passes okay so there he says that uh, i don't remember the exact lines but it is there there's one stanza in which he says the bird is flying the flowers are blooming uh, uh, the flowers are blooming and the uh, snail is on the thorn all right with the world it is not right with the world <laughs> so that's an easy optimism so easy optimism is not necessarily the truth <laughs> that's what he saying and mark that country a few decades after the lord of karma has paid the price of the blood and the suffering that was given you shall see it in its turn an oppressor an exploiter and conqueror of colonies and dependencies devouring others that it may live and succeed aggressively in life okay. the christian martyrs perish in the thousands setting soul forth against empire force that christ may conquer christianity prevail soul force does triumph christianity does prevail but not christ not the real spirit <laughs> Sure, Bindo doesn't mince words. <laughs> so Christianity has prevailed, but not the ideals of Christ. Christianity is very one-sided, and it tries to impose itself on everybody through proselytizing, proselytizing, preaching, and conversion. So that's what it's saying. <clears throat> and note interestingly that this aggressive wanting to. make convert into christians is again opposed okay by others those who want to stand up for themselves in india several states have made laws against conversion is the opposite force again <laughs> so setting soul force soul force does triumph christianity does prevail but not christ the victorious religion becomes a militant and dominant church and a more fanatically persecuting power than the creed and the empire which it replaced so islam is a good example it made a huge empire okay and now they are the oppressor <laughs> now they they are trying to establish themselves again the empire has disappeared but that spirit has not disappeared <laughs> the fighting also, also the inquisition of the christians that's right <clears throat> in fact that's the reason why those who are supposed to be intellectuals they say that religion is a is a bad force it's an anti divine force <laughs> religion <laughs> there are how much harm it has caused everywhere and every religion ah huh, mind you every religion has got negative aspects every religion because it's made by human beings and human beings are imperfect <laughs> in hinduism you must make a distinction between hinduism as practiced normally 
and the advaita philosophy that's different okay but the hindu religion has caused such misery to vidori marriage is not allowed okay and uh, they are banished when there is a, a young widow is there in the house you are a sign of inauspiciousness go away to varanasi and remain there there is a whole place where widows are there <laughs> and so many other things are there like that every religion what about the oppression of the shudras in india it is still going on misinterpretation of the scriptures <laughs> so this in every religion it has been there <laughs> so and a more fanatically persecuting power than the creed and the empire which it replaced the very religions organized themselves into powers of mutual strife and battle together fiercely to live to grow to possess the world we stop here today <laughs> so what's the burden of what he's saying which he'll continue for two more paragraphs that not that easy to uh, bring peace and unless you change mankind and change the human nature into something better 